Tonight we're going to get into the first part of a three-part look at the resist aspect of this message. Say resist. It's Super Bowl Sunday, and what a great weekend to talk about how to effectively resist our opponent. We call him the devil. And what a perfect moment to talk about the battle that we are engaged in as the people of God. How many of you guys know we are in a battle? We live in the West. We are blessed to live in the United States of America. But come on, we are in a spiritual battle each and every day that we leave our house. In just a few moments, we're going to watch a couple teams battle it out for the title of being called champion, world champion. Now, why they call it world champion, I'll never know because they only play these games in the United States, except for maybe London once a year. But two teams are going to battle it out for, for the title of champion or victor. And interestingly enough, it's in sports like football, maybe you're not into football and that's cool. Maybe you like other sports, or maybe you're not into sports at all. But it's interesting to me in looking at sports like football, where you have two teams that are so committed to engaging in the battle. They're trying to win. They're trying to overcome. And I believe that that speaks to something on the inside of each and every one of us, that there is an internal war, both internally and externally that we face. Just think about those classic movies like Rocky or Remember the Titans or my personal favorite, Rudy. How many of you guys like Rudy? I love Rudy because Rudy is the story of an underdog. It's the story of a man for whom the odds are stacked against him. And yet in the end, he learns how to triumph. He learns how to persevere and win. And I think the reason that we're drawn to these stories is because they carry a universal appeal. They speak to what's innate within the human heart to triumph over adversity. Say triumph. Speaking to this reality today, I believe we serve a God who wants us to triumph in life. He wants us to win in the battle that we're engaged in. He doesn't want you just to survive. He didn't save you and leave you here on this earth just to get through it. Come on, he wants us to triumph, to overcome. Why? Because he's put the spirit of a champion on the inside of us. He's put the spirit of a champion overcoming God on the inside of us. And he wants us to win in life. In order for us to do that, I believe, though, we've got to first understand the battle that we're in, and we need to know our enemy. The title of my message today is this, Know Your Enemy. Know Your Enemy. 2 Corinthians, go there with me, chapter 2, verse 10 through 11 says this, and when I forgive what needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority. Say, with Christ's authority. And Paul says, I do this with Christ's authority for your benefit. Verse 11, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Friend, God wants you to know that your enemy, he wants you to know your enemy so that he won't outsmart you. He wants you to know your enemy so that he won't outsmart you. And one of the ways that we do that is becoming familiar with his schemes. So, so today I want to look at three schemes or three tactics that the enemy tries to use in our life to come against us. Using Nehemiah, as we have over the last six weeks now, I want to continue to look at his story as a spiritual lens through which we can understand the tactics that the enemy uses against us. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. We were looking at Nehemiah 3. Today, we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, and here's what it says. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed, and he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer up sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble that are burned? Verse 3, then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Or what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stone. So right off the bat, we see this conflict emerging here. Now, all of a sudden, Nehemiah and his crew have given themselves to the task of rebuilding the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. Now, all of a sudden, have an enemy. They have somebody who has taken up opposition against them. 
We see this conflict emerge the minute the people begin to make progress. And I want you to keep that in mind because they're building, they're busy rebuilding the walls. And the crazy thing is it's actually working. <laughs> they're actually doing it. What they've come together to, to do, they're actually succeeding at. But right at that moment, an enemy approaches, an accuser shows up on the scene. And in this story, his name is Sanballat. Say Sanballat. What's Sanballat busy doing? He's heaping insult upon insult. He's bringing ridicule and accusation against the people of God. Him and his stupid friend Tobiah the Ammonite, who also have come to oppose the people of God, they're openly mocking the Jews. They're coming against them and their effort to rebuild. Can I tell you something? Just like Nehemiah and the Jewish people here have an enemy, we too have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he is the accuser. He is the adversary. And he loves to, number one, bring accusation against you. He'll start with insults. He'll start with ridicule. He'll start with anything that he can to get your attention off of what God wants you to focus on building. He loves to bring accusation against you. I believe this is one of his chief tactics in the battle that we're engaged in. So anytime, hear me on this, anytime you make a commitment to draw closer to God, get ready for the insults to happen. Get ready for people in your life not to understand you. Get ready for your friends and your family to start ridiculing you. Oh, there goes Jeff again. There goes Matt again trying to be all holy. Who does he think he is, right? Who do you think you are trying to make those changes? Who do you think you are trying to draw close to God? What gives you the right Anybody experienced that before? Yes. Truth is, most people don't have a problem with you when you're struggling. Most people will get in your pain with you and wall around in it when you're struggling. But the moment you decide to make progress, to be about what God is inviting you to build, that's when the accusations show up. This is why I believe we have to be so careful, you guys, of the kinds of friends that we choose, the kind of company that we choose to keep. Here's a good, just kind of simple test uh, that you can use to test to see if your, your friends are really for you or against you. You ready? When you share good news with your friends, are they genuinely excited for you? Or do they become immediately sarcastic? You ever notice that person for whom when you're really excited about something, they just start using sarcasm to kind of bite at you? Sort of this backhanded compliment. You know why? Because your excitement makes them feel insecure. It got real quiet in this Baptist church tonight. <laughs> Woo, I think I hit a nerve. My goodness. What about this? When you speak about your dreams and the goals that you want to accomplish, do these same people tend to encourage you or do they point out how your idea won't work? You'll never be able to do that. Oh, no. Some of you, you had parents like this. And God wants to set you free from that. So the question is, are you... Surrounding yourself with builders or complainers. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Sambalot is the picture of a complainer who shows up and quickly becomes an enemy to the work of God. And here's the problem with complainers. Complainers will always attract other complainers to join them. And make no mistake, these people will tear you down. They will tear you down. Sambalot shows up. And next thing you know, Tobiah is there right by his side, mocking the work of God in Nehemiah's life. Complainers will always attract other complainers. Accusation will always bring about more accusation. Mark Driscoll, pastor of the Trinity Church, I made this remark at a conference that my wife and I attended a couple years ago in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I think it's so helpful, and it might be really helpful for you, so I want to give it to you today. He says, biblically speaking, there's really only three kinds of people that you're going to encounter in this world. Number one, you're going to encounter evil people. Evil people have one agenda, and that is this, to hurt you. They need professional and clinical help. You can't befriend them, nor should you allow them anywhere near your kids because they are often sick and unwell and will harm you on purpose and willfully because they're evil. Foolish people, on the other hand, don't know any better. They may hurt you accidentally or do dumb things, but it's because they're foolish, not because they're evil. 
They're ignorant, and often because they are ignorant, they've never learned how to make good decisions. You can love these people, but you should keep them at a distance. Some of you have tried to love evil people, and you get hurt, and then you wonder why. And some of you have surrounded yourself with friends who are foolish, and then you wonder why you make foolish decisions. You can love foolish people, but you need to keep them at a safe distance. Wise people, on the other hand, know better. They're not going to hurt you or do dumb things in your life. They're actually going to help you, and they're going to look for ways to invest in the things that you care about and are excited about. They're not perfect people, but they are healthy people, and they're able to help you make healthy and good decisions for your life. These are the kinds of people that you and I need in our life and that we need to surround ourselves with. This is why, as a pastor, I spend a lot of time getting wise counsel from other pastors and leaders, because I want to surround myself with wise counsel. Why? Because Proverbs 13, verse 20 says this, walk with the wise and you'll become wise. Associate with fools, people, and get in trouble. Some of you are in trouble over and over and over and over, and you don't know why. And I can look at your friends and I can tell you why. Because you're hanging out with fools. Because you spend all of your time with idiots. Just going to leave that out there and let that simmer for a little while. Pastor Jason, take it easy today. Calling me out. Hey, the shoe fits. You guys, we need to be careful of the people that we surround them surround ourselves with one of my uh, good friends, Pastor Doug, who's a board member of our church. He always used to say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. We tell our young people that. We tell our kids that. That's why we're, as parents, we're really careful. And as parents, you need to be careful of the kinds of people that you let your kids hang out with. Number one, most kids aren't going to have those kinds of friends for life, right? And if you're fortunate to have a couple good friends that you can count on one hand, you're a blessed person. But the truth is, we got to be careful. That's why we don't allow our kids to do sleepovers at other people's houses, because we can't protect and shepherd what other people do in their homes, but we can protect and shepherd what people do in ours. Walk with wise and become wise. Some of you need to start surrounding yourself with wise people. Candace and I are notorious for having friends that are 10, 20, and 30 years older than us. Some of our favorite people on the planet are in their 70s, and we like to go and have vacations with them and spend time with them. You know why? Because we learn from them, because they're wise, and our lives are enriched by that. Some of you young 20-somethings and 30-somethings, you wonder why your life is stuck where it is. It's because you've gotten advice from your peers, not from wise counsel. Walk with the wise and become wise. God makes it really simple. Associate with fools and you'll get in trouble. So we need to be careful about the kinds of people that we allow to come into our life and to have influence. Continue in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, it says, but when Sambalot and Tobiah, and now guess who showed up? The Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. Now they've brought in friends. It's become a whole party. The wrong kinds of people that you don't want hanging out at your, at your home. And when all these people and all these different groups heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. Say very angry. As I already mentioned, people are not going to like the progress that you make when you turn your life over to God and when you begin to commit to a life devoted to Jesus. And it says this. So... Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Verse 8. No, I'm not getting ahead of myself. And they all plotted together. Verse 8. Next next slide. And they all plotted together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to do what? To cause confusion in the camp. To cause confusion in it. So the, the initial tactics of the enemy start with ridicule and mocking and accusation. And then what do they do? they move into the plotting of real harm and the causing of confusion. You guys seeing a theme here? You seeing a thread? This is exactly what the enemy wants to do in our life. He actually plots to come against us and to fight us and to cause confusion in our homes and in our minds if, if, and this is a big if, if we're an actual perceived threat to his schemes, if we're actually a perceived threat to the plans that he has. As long as you remain oblivious to his devices and you're no actual threat to his schemes, he doesn't really have to bother with you, does he? As long as you get caught up in your own sin and your own selfish living, he doesn't have to bother with us. But the moment, the moment that you decide to become dangerous, the moment you decide to become dangerous by joining Jesus and what he's building in the earth, get ready for him to come at you from all sides. Get ready for him to oppose you and to try to do what? Bring about confusion in your life. Which brings us to number two. 
If accusations won't work, he'll use confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 says this, for God is not a God of what? Of confusion, but of peace. You guys, God is not the God of confusion in your life. So if you're feeling confused and you're frustrated and you're overwhelmed and you're feeling anxious and stressed, that's not God at work in your life. That's the presence of an enemy trying to come against you. And we as a people have to take responsibility for what God has called us to take responsibility for. That means we got to close doors that he wants to be closed. Some of us have left open doors and, we don't, and then we wonder why we are being attacked. Close the door. The devil can't come in. It's real simple. God is not the author of confusion. So if you're wrestling with this and you're battling confusion, we want to pray for you. But we also want to equip you to learn how to do some stuff. Learn how to... And then take the key and lock the door and don't open it again. Some of us, this is what happens. We close the door when we get saved And we're all excited about Jesus. And then we slip back into old patterns and ways of thinking, right? Because our minds haven't been renewed. And we open that door. And come on in. Come cuddle with me on the couch. Let's watch Netflix together. What do they call that? Where you just like invite your friend over to Netflix and chill? (laughs) Some of you guys are Netflix and chilling with all the wrong people. And you've left some open doors that God really wants to help you close. So of course, we'll pray for you. I like that Nehemiah's response in verse nine is this. It says, so we prayed, verse nine, Nehemiah chapter four. So we prayed to our God and set a guard. So oftentimes when we pray, we pray that God would set a guard over our hearts and minds so that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would do what? It would protect us. I love that picture. And so the response to the enemy showing up to bring confusion is that Nehemiah prays. He doesn't gossip. He doesn't complain. He doesn't run home and cry to mama. Mama, they don't like me. What does he do? He prays. He turns to the Lord and he sets a guard. Now, physically he does this, and we're going to see this in just a moment. But I I think that for many of us, this isn't our first instinct to turn to God in prayer when we experience confusion. Our first instinct is to react, get upset, get angry, write that message that we probably should have deleted before we hit send, right? We get all worked up. We allow, and we receive counsel from the wrong people. We go out and search for the Sambalots and Tobias when really we should be looking for the wise voices and sages in our life. So Nehemiah prays. And then we see this in verse 11. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So now the work of the enemy has moved from accusation to the plotting to bring about harm and confusion to the actual desire to kill the people and stop the work. So number three today, one of the enemy's schemes is to kill you and stop your work. If he can't, bring about accusation because you know who you are in Christ Jesus. You know that he's already taken care of your sin problem on that cross in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on. Then he'll try to bring about confusion and try to get you to look this way and that way and cause misdirection. If he can't do that because the God of peace is working in your life and you've sanctified your heart and mind with the word and you're protecting yourself and you've got those doors closed, then eventually he's just going to try to kill you because he knows that you're dangerous and he doesn't want a dangerous threat walking around. Ultimately, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to kill you and stop God working in your life. This is why we have to resist him. This is why we have to resist. You see, the devil has only one real mission, and that is to kill and destroy what God wants to build in your life. Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that our enemy is like a thief who comes to do what? To steal, kill, and destroy. Like Sambalot, And like the Pharisees that Jesus is actually alluding to in in that telling of that story, this is exactly what our enemy Satan wants to do, which is why we have to resist. What is Nehemiah's response? Nehemiah's response is that he prays, he sets a guard, and then he prepares for war. 
he resists. Let's look at it together. Verse 13. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, I love this picture, and in the open places, I wonder what open places God wants you to fill the gap for this year. I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Woo, it's time for war, baby. He says, it's time to get ready for the battle. So he positions the people in all the different gaps and places of the wall in the open spaces behind and in front and alongside with their swords, spears, and bows. This is, a, this is a physical picture of a spiritual reality that God wants us to grab a hold of. I really believe this. It's time for us. Are you ready for it? It's time for us to pick up our sword. What's our sword, gang? Come on. Ephesians 6 tells us it's the sword of the spirit, right? We all have been given a sword, not just to admire Oh, I just love my Bible. It's so, it's so nice. It comforts me. It's my precious moments. You know, I, sit, I have it next to me on the, on the couch or on the bed, you know, the lampstand. It's just there just to, you know, tell me I'm nice. It's my little manual for life. It's, no, you guys, it's a, it's a freaking sword. That's right. That's right. And it's time for us and as the church to pick up our sword again. Why is it that we are living in the generation that's the most biblical illiterate? People died to have this. P- people still die to have this. I know people that are smuggling these swords into China right now to arm the saints of God so they can stand strong against the enemy. I wish I had this video, but there's this amazing video. Maybe you guys have seen it. It kind of went viral on YouTube a few years ago. So these people in Africa being given a Bible for the first time and they're just like rejoicing like they had just received a winning lottery ticket. It's one of the most amazing things. I'll have to try to find that later and show that next week. But I really think that we need to value our swords, you guys. And short, swords are not meant to be kept only in sheaths. They're meant to be taken out and used. That's the picture that Nehemiah is preparing the people for. You guys, grab your sword in their case, their spear and their bow. I, I love that. It's like, are you, are you good at something? Awesome, grab that thing that you're good at. There's people that had spears, people that had bows, people that were trained in the art of warfare. I think the church needs to be trained in the art of warfare. We need to read our Bibles and consume the Bibles and, and allow the word of God to reshape and redefine how we fight our battles. So Nehemiah calls the people to arms. And then I love what he says next. Finally, verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of people. Basically, I arose and I looked to the leadership and I said to the people, do not be afraid of the enemy. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight, fight, fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. You guys need to fight for your brothers and your sisters and your wives and your homes. We do this in prayer. We do this in engaging the word of God. We do this in in what we give our lives and our mouth to and our worship to. But the bottom line is that we need to fight. We need to take an active stance, an active posture to fight. The text tells us, don't be afraid. So number one, we don't have to fear. Number two, we need to remember who our God is. We're not fighting alone. As we sang about, the battle belongs to the Lord. What does that mean? It means that God's on our side. It means that we're on the winning side, amen? And we need to take the posture of one who fights. And I think for some of you that have been wounded in the fight, the temptation is to just remain wounded. It's to curl up in your little hospital bed and have the church and her leadership just care for you. But you know what? I'd be doing you a disservice if at some point I didn't say it's time to get out of the hospital bed. It's time to get back on the front lines of your faith and it's time to pick up your sword and it's time to go to war. I'm wondering if I'm talking to any warriors tonight. Anybody ready to go to war tonight? Next week, we're gonna look at how we fight our battles. And on that cliffhanger, let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you for helping us know our enemies so that we won't be defeated by our enemy. Help us, Lord, to to know what the enemy's doing so that we won't be outsmarted. But, Lord, so that we can be effective in this battle that you've called us to be in. Lord, the battle is not won 
by trying to beat people up in the flesh, Lord, our, our battle's not with flesh and blood, but it is with spiritual forces in, of wickedness in heavenly places. It is against the rulers and authorities and those that are set against your kingdom. So Lord, help us to not make enemies out of people that aren't enemies, but help us to realize that our battle is spiritual and that we have to take an active stance in it, God, that we have to fight. Lord, you love us so much that you didn't leave us unequipped. You gave us the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, Lord, and the belt buckle of truth, Lord God, and the boots of the gospel of peace so that we could stand ready, fully equipped to fight the battles that you've called us to fight and to win. Lord, we thank you that you said in your word that we are more than overcomers, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for that picture that you're inviting us into. May we be encouraged, God, not to just allow our swords to remain in their sheets, but Lord, may this year, 2022, be the year where we do some havoc on the enemy's kingdom, where we come against him, where the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church because the church is advancing, not taking a defensive posture. Lord, out of COVID, I pray that you would awaken your church, Lord, to advance in the earth, to not be afraid because we remember who our God is. So I pray, church, that you would remember who your God is, the God who parts the seas, the God who raises the dead, the God who heals the sick, the God who causes the sun to stand still, the God who can cause it to rain or not to rain upon the land. So don't fear the report of famine. Don't fear the report of inflation. Don't fear the the economic forecast. Don't fear what's happening politically. Don't get sucked into that battle. That's not our battle. Our battle is to stand firm on the word of God and to trust You, Jesus, with what you said you would do until you come riding in on that white horse again as the soon conquering and coming king. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said amen. Amen. Come on, amen. Let's put our hands together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.